As a history professor, of course, I have to do a lot of reading for work. And uh, I would say during my doctoral program uh, and while I was on tenure track at Baylor, I really didn't do very much reading other than the things that I needed to do for work. Um, and so this is mostly reading in, uh, in religious history and, and in particular about the, the books that I was currently uh, researching and writing. Um, but I, I would say since I got tenure at, at Baylor, that, that you know, brings more security professionally. And so that has led me to um, broaden my reading habits a little bit more. Um, and, and so I've actually gotten back involved in occasionally reading fiction, uh, which I, I, I found was a bit of a difficult transition because when I'm reading professionally, um, I do tend to read to get the basic gist of a book rather than the details uh, because we have to read so many books. Um, and and uh, those of you who are in graduate programs know what I mean, um, that, that you're just consuming an enormous number of books uh, in a very short period of time. And so when you do that kind of reading, you tend to only maybe spend a few hours with a book uh, rather than uh, reading every line. And I find when you're reading fiction, I, I I just don't get anything out of the book unless I'm reading it word for word, uh, and if it's a if it's a bad book, fiction book, I just put it down because I can't <laughs> I can't stand spending a lot of a time time with a book that I just don't don't like that much. And I read uh, theology or devotional books uh, pretty much the same way, uh, not not academic theology books because that's not really my field, uh, but but more you know popular type of theology books the, the same way. Um, I do most of my uh, scholarly reading uh, at work during the day, and then I usually have a book or two that I'm, I'm working through at night. Um, and then, uh, of course, I, I, I do read the Bible every day, um, and, and that's usually the first thing that I do every morning is I usually have a Bible reading plan that I'm going, going through to read the Bible through in a year, or maybe sometimes I'll do. I read the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs through in a year if I don't want to be taking in you know vast amounts from the Old Testament every day and and so uh, but I, but I, I go usually but right now I'm on, I'm back on a, a reading the Bible through in a year program and that's the first thing that I do every morning. So uh, the question is how do I uh, process a book professionally when I'm reading, say, uh, a new history book that's come out in my field or so something like that. Um, what I tend to do is, if there are book reviews available, I'll, I'll read maybe two or three book reviews to try to get a sense for what what is this book and where where is this book located in the literature, uh, uh, the scholarly liter literature on this subject. Uh, say it's a book on the Great Awakening or some, something like that. And I'll, I'll see if there's reviews available. I'll, I'll read those to kind of get my bearings and maybe the response that some other scholars have had to this book. And then uh, as I go into the book itself, I'll usually read, uh, say, the introduction word for word because normally that's going to unpack the argument and where the book is going, the kind of sources that the book is using. And then uh, in the chapters, a lot of times what I'll do is maybe read uh, the first and last paragraph of every chapter uh, word for word. And then as I get into the body of the chapter, maybe I'll read every uh, first and last sentence or every first sentence. If it's a really compelling book, of course, I, I'll, I'll normally slow down or, or if, it's, if it gets into a topic that I'm researching right now, uh, I'll, I'll of course read that material. Uh, more closely, or, or sometimes I might find the book to be uh, poorly written or, or just frustrating for one reason or another, and I'll go faster through the, through the book jump, just feeling like I'm not getting that much out of the details here. Uh, but and then and then when I get to the conclusion, I'll usually read that word for word as well. Um, I always read the acknowledgments of, of, of books unless they're ex especially long. I always like to see you know who they worked with on on this book and that that sort of thing, but. That method of, of reading, I think, generally allows you to process a book in maybe two or three hours. Um, if, if you need to, it can be even shorter than that. 
um, obviously you can tweak the amount that you're, you're actually reading. Now, uh, this is uh, really just a management strategy for the amount of reading that a professional historian and, and academics in other fields have to do. I mean, I can remember uh, when I was in my PhD program at Notre Dame, I counted up one time when I was in coursework and I figured out that I was reading about seven books a week um, in addition to going to classes and writing papers and, and other things that I needed to be doing. And so when you're having to read seven books a, a week, I mean, you can set up the ideal of reading it word for word, but I, I realized in that first year as I was up at three o'clock in the morning and trying to read these books, word for word, what was actually happening is I was probably uh, ruining my health. And then also uh, I would read, say the first third or the first half of a book very closely and then neglect the second half of the book. And that, that's, that's no good either. So I, I think most academic books will have the ideal of understanding what is the thesis of this book? What's the contribution that this book is making. And if you can glean that from a, a shorter, quicker method of, of reading, you really are getting something important out of the book. And if you need to know the details, for, say for your research, uh, you can certainly go back and, and review those later. So I, I feel like that's a compromise that you just have to make as a professional academic. Uh, my decisions about what to read next uh, operate um, on very different kinds of purposes. Um, for my professional life, um, my decisions about what to read next have everything to do with what I am currently researching. Um, and so uh, if, if I'm re researching such and such a topic about the Great Awakening or, or 19th century reform movements, then um, I may have, I've, I've read a lot on those topics already, of course, for, for years in the past. So it may be that I don't need to do an enormous amount of new reading. I just need to get into the primary sources uh, on that topic, so tor sources from the 1740s or the 1830s, instead of updated books and articles that are being written today. But uh, I would normally, at that stage of research, take some time to try to figure out, uh, are there new books that have come uh, out in recent years that I'm not aware of yet or I haven't read yet that I really need to go back and, and look at? And I'll, and I'll take some time then to, to uh, go through those, those books. But um, usually uh, the, the books that I'm most likely, or articles I'm most likely to be reading at that moment are related to the chapter or even just the paragraphs that I'm currently trying to write in my ongoing uh, book project that I'm, that I'm writing. Uh, or uh, occasionally I'll also be reading a book that I've been commissioned to review uh, in, a, in a published book review, or I'll be reading a manuscript that a press has commissioned me to review for them internally. Um, and so a, a lot of it is, is dictated by what do I need to be researching right now or what have I been commissioned to read so that I can evaluate it for, uh, for a press or say a magazine. Um, for my personal reading, uh, I, my reading habits are much more eclectic and just occasional and, and just what I feel like reading. Um, of course, my Bible reading is, is not that way, but, but um, uh, anything I read in the evening um, is going to be dictated by just what I feel like reading because it is uh, for edification and learning, but it's also just to relax and something that's, that's hopefully profitable, but maybe also a, a good story to read about. And so, um, uh, for instance, right now I'm reading uh, a book about a... Um, one of the biggest art thefts uh, that has happened in, in the history of the world, I suppose, at the, the Gardner Museum in Boston, I think in the 1990s, there was this incredible uh, unsolved caper where they took a Rembrandt and they took uh, uh, some other really valuable uh, paintings from this museum. And uh, it's just a great story. I'm really interested in the history of art. 
it's not my field, but it's something that I'm really interested in. And, and this is a book that, that's very readable. There's a crime story dynamic to it. And I, I just love reading those kind of things. It's a good thing to do in the evening when I'm kind of getting ready for bed, I'm winding down. I don't want to really re be reading professional stuff at that time. I've done enough of that during the day. And so I just pick stuff that I'm interested in that's hopefully, um, you know, at least somewhat in intellectually stimulating and edifying, and I go from there. The way that I remember what I've read, again, depends a lot on why I'm reading it. Um, the, the things that I read personally and just for, for pleasure, of course, I don't make any systematic attempt to remember it. Um, and I think that, that uh, we are influenced, I think, over the long term. We, we, I, I'm no professional on this, but I know that there's an unconscious effect that even the things that we have read but we have, quote, forgotten, I think, make our, our mind. And, and uh, I, I can even sense this sometimes uh, when there, there are things in history that I know uh, and I can relate dates and, and developments and basically explain things. I have no idea where I got it from. I, you know, I couldn't possibly tell you what book or books or articles I learned this from, but there's a kind of aggregate effect of things that we've read in the past. And maybe we didn't even take notes on or anything, but we retained it somehow, or it can be recalled when, when needed. So I, I guess I would say, first of all, don't underestimate that kind of cumulative effect of of consistent reading can can have even if you're not making some sort of sort of systematic attempt to capture it and remember it and, and so forth. Now, uh, when I'm reading professionally, um, obviously there's a level at which I'm trying to uh, identify the most important material in in a book, and so uh, sometimes when I'm doing preparatory reading for a new research project that I'm doing. I'll read very broadly in that uh, topic and I'll have my highlighter and I'll be dog-earing pages that have particularly important information. And um, sometimes I will plug uh, that, uh, a, a quote or a source or a letter uh, into an ongoing file that I keep uh, about this research project that's gonna be a book. Um, and and I'll, I'll read something and I'll say, I, okay, I know I need to deal, deal with that in the book, or at least I want to remember that that uh, source exists. And so I'll plug it into uh, just a Word file or maybe an Excel file um, that I'm keeping a record of sources that I'm going to want to consult as I go through the book. And maybe I'm picking up things in kind of random places in these general books that, that I'm reading about this topic. Um, but I, I also think that you can overdo it with note-taking in particular. Um, I, I think a lot of people uh, tend to be a little aimless about their note-taking and, and, and they're, they're sort of, you know, you ask them, how's your, how's your book project going? They say, well, I'm doing research. I'm just, I'm just doing a lot of research. And, and my question usually is, what, so when are you going to write? I mean, <laughs> we need to get to writing here at some point. And I, I think for me, there's a, a lot of a lot of my writing process is is very close uh, in proximity to the research process, so that uh, if I'm needing to write something uh, about so something you know, founding fathers and religion, maybe I'm writing about um, Thomas Jefferson's uh, Wall of Separation letter, what he talked about the, the separation between church and state. Um, I find that I don't need to know the details about that a year or two ago. I need to know it right now. And so, uh, I, I, you know, if I took notes about it a long time ago, may, maybe I would be able to return to that and it would be helpful. But what I actually find the most helpful in my writing process is, okay, I'm on this topic of Thomas Jefferson's Wall of Separation letter. Now I'm going to pull the books off my shelf that I need to consult about exactly how that episode played out. And I'm going to bring articles up on my computer. I'm going to you know, you know, research, obviously, the primary sources that are involved in that episode. And I'm going to bring it all together right now 
and I'm going to read as much of the secondary sources as I need to right now for this paragraph or two or three paragraphs in this book, and I'm going to put it together in the here and now. And so I don't, I don't really find it that helpful to me uh, to take all these extensive notes and, and have all these things that aren't directly associated with the actual writing, not just of the book, but of this chapter and this paragraph. So I, I probably take fewer notes on uh, both secondary and primary sources um, than probably your average uh, professor does. Uh, how do I know, know what I need to consult right now? Well, some of that is uh, uh, things that you develop over the course of a PhD program. I mean, I mean, one of the things that you're doing in a PhD program, um, at least in history, is that um, you are doing such extensive reading. Uh, I, you know, I mentioned before that I'm reading seven books a week, and you know, when you come to take your uh, PhD exams, you're being examined over maybe. 300 books, uh, you, you know, you're, you're putting together a professional level of knowledge in your chosen area. So at least as of that time, you now have professional level expertise about what literature exists in the field on this range of topics. And I, I think sometimes PhD students and, and new professors almost forget about that. I mean, they, 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 you know, you know a lot. And, and, and of course, you, you know, you need to refresh your, be updated about what's happening in, in the field. Um, but uh, if you ask me about a particular topic in religion in the American founding, for instance, um, which wasn't even my dissertation area, but, but it became an expertise of mine, I could with great confidence identify, say, I think off the top of my head, 95% of the key books and articles that exist on that topic. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty confident I could do that. That's one of the things, that's why you go through a PhD program and then remain up to date in, in your field. Then I need to check to see if there's new things out there that I've missed. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and, Universal coverage is is pretty unlikely on on any given topic, but I think you develop a, an intuitive sense of what's the most important material out there. What do you need to consult? And so, uh, when I'm working on the next paragraphs of my current uh, book project, I, I do. I, I have uh, a number of books that I'm likely to consult that are sitting on my shelf in my office. And then uh, I, any articles related to the subject I can usually bring up on my computer uh, through our library resources. And uh, between that and the, the uh, primary sources, um, a lot of it I've read already at some point in my career. And so I'm pretty well uh, ready to go. So I don't, I, I, by this point in my career, I don't worry a lot about, am I gonna miss things? Because I, I, I know enough to, to write about these kind of, topics, but it's just a matter of what's usually going to be new for me, mostly, is getting into the actual sources in the time period in question and walking through and being able to explain to a reader who, uh, in a lot of cases, is not going to be necessarily an expert on this topic, uh, what actually happened. That, that, that's the challenge that I'm facing. A couple of books that I would be really happy if um, any college student would, would read, especially if you have interest in history. Uh, one, one would be Why Study History by John Fia uh, at Messiah College. And I, I think that's just a great introduction, especially for people who are Christians, uh, to think about the point of studying history, uh, what, what being educated in history does for a person personally in a sense of just you know, being a basically educated person and, and why it's important for Christians to know about history. Uh, I, I just think that's a great introduction, very up-to-date kind of introduction about uh, why in this age when there's so much pressure uh, about studying, you know, not studying humanities, studying stuff that's, you know, science and math and getting a job and all these kind of things, 
uh, I think that's just a great case for um, you know, humanities kind of learning, but history in, in particular. Um, one favorite history book of mine that I think would work really well uh, for a college student is a, is a book called um, The Strange Career of Jim Crow by C. Van Woodward. Um, this book uh, was, was written in the midst of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and, and 60s. And uh, Jim Crow was the system of racial segregation that was um, most pronounced in the South, but it was there in, in all parts of the United States. And um, it's a short book. It's, it's so readable. Um, uh, C. Van Woodward was one of the great uh, professional historians of that era. And um, one of the things he discovered is that Jim Crow um, actually began in the North rather than in the South. Um, and, and when you think about it, uh, it's, it's kind of not that surprising that this would be the case. It's because the North it was more urban than, than the South, and Jim Crow is usually for urban spaces. And so, and so segregated restaurants and se segregated streetcars, segregated railroads. Um, and a lot of that, he, he, he realized, uh, started in the North. And so uh, I think one of the points that he was trying to make is that if you think that Jim Crow is just natural to the South, uh, and, and that, that would make it, I think, that much more difficult for the South to get rid of it. But if the South actually picked this up from the North, that tells you a couple things. Um, one is that uh, the, the nation as a whole has problems with racism and, and uh, segregation, but it also somehow makes it a, a little more easy to envision the South giving up Jim Crow. Uh, if there was a time when the North uh, had uh, a more entrenched form of Jim Crow than, than the South did. Now, it, it's not just the content of that book that I would recommend, though I do, um, but I think that that's a wonderful example of a book that uh, shows the surprises that you find when you study actual history. Um, it tends to blow up these kind of misconceptions and illusions that you have about the way things worked in the past. Um, I think that it, 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 you know, some Northerners at that time could probably sort of pat themselves on the back and say, well, at least we don't have any problems with segregation and so forth. And it's not true. Uh, but it also shows that history can have really helpful purposes in kind of understanding current events. So C. Van Woodward is writing this in the middle of the civil rights movement, and lots of civil rights activists read this book. And it made a difference, I think, in the way people thought about segregation and public policy. And, and so I always think of that book as, as just, it's so readable, it's short, it, it's easy to read, uh, and it made a huge difference in American public life. And I just think it's a great example of history that made a difference. The advice that I would have for people who find themselves reading a difficult book is, is partly to just try to understand why the book is difficult. Um, because there certainly are books out there that are just simply badly written and maybe not even that valuable. And I, I would just say, give up on the, a book like that. It's okay, you don't, you don't have to feel obligated to read through a book that you're just, you know, you're not getting anything out of it. But I, I think sometimes uh, for, for readers, it can be difficult to distinguish between what's just a badly written book and what is a very demanding but rewarding book. And especially a lot of times when we're reading historical sources, um, theologians, pastors, uh, other religious writers in the, in the past, someone like Jonathan Edwards, for instance, um, who I think is the greatest theologian in American history. Um, but when you especially read his uh, theological writings, not his sermons, but, but his writings like uh, Original Sin uh, is, is one of his great theological treatises, it is extremely difficult to understand uh, because it is just uh, a, an enormously brilliant theologian in a very different time from ours uh, at work. And so um, when, you, when you read... Uh, people like that, I, th I think you just have to remind yourself 
I'm not going to understand all this, and that's okay. Um, I may need to find a way to take just excerpts or snippets of this, maybe in a, it, since we're talking about Jonathan Edwards, a Jonathan Edwards reader that just has short selections from his writings and don't necessarily feel obligated to dive into, you know, a 500 page theological treatise first. Um, and also to remember uh, that, you know, people say that history is like a foreign country and that people do things differently there. Um, and I think that's, that's right when you're reading about unfamiliar history, unfamiliar writers from the past, that it, it's sort of like if you, you visited a country uh, where they don't speak your language and they have different traditions and social conventions and that sort of thing. Um, you just have to get comfortable with the idea that there's a, a certain uh, unfamiliarity, it's disorienting, um, that they're, they're assuming things that you don't already know. Um, and so that, that's really okay. And so I, I really would recommend, uh, for instance, reading Jonathan Edwards if you have an interest in the history of American theology. But it's dazzling uh, and it can be confusing and uh, you won't understand uh, from the get-go what he's getting at, especially in his theological writings. But uh, the reward is definitely worth the effort. I think one of the most underrated uh, history books that, that I've read in the past 10 or 15 years is a book called Sarah Osborne's World by Catherine Breckis, who is uh, now at, on faculty at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and uh, I, I think that one of the challenges that Breckis was dealing with in that book is that Sarah Osborne, uh, who, was, uh, uh, who lived in 18th century uh, Rhode Island, uh, was one of the most prolific evangelical authors of her time, um, but was not very well known even in her own time uh, because a lot of her writing was never published during her life. Um, and it and so Sarah Osborne, um, even though she was a very important evangelical leader in Newport, Rhode Island, even though she played an important role in some early debates about the morality of slavery, uh, and even, uh, even though she had no pastoral role, of course, at, at, at the time, she was an important revival leader in, in Newport, Rhode Island, and she wrote uh, just vast amounts of personal diaries and other theological writings. She wasn't even that well-known in her own time, and uh, today we, we tend, to, even in the study of evangelicalism, we tend to focus only on uh, preachers and evangelists uh, in, a, in a formal sense, people like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Billy Graham in the 20th century, and uh, uh, women, uh, uh, non-whites, tend to get left out of this, this sort of equation. Um, and, and one of the things I love about Sarah Osborne's world is that um, it, it approaches not so much, uh, you know, look, here's, here's a woman who was important too, but it is a really deep, uh, and provocative and challenging intellectual history of what what did it look like to be a, a kind of regular evangelical uh, woman in the 18th century. And we find out that Sarah Osborne was struggling with some really uh, deep questions about the inherent depravity of mankind, about um, the morality of slavery, um, about God's providence in her own life. Uh, these are some really perennial, uh, deep, challenging issues that I think lots of believers have, have struggled with. And Breckes, I think, uh, approaches this analysis in such a sympathetic, readable, uh, compassionate way uh, towards Sarah Osborne that I, I just love that book. Um, it, it, I think a lot of academics in the field knew about it, but I wish lots of general readers who have an interest in American religion would, would read that book. Um, one book that might surprise people as one of my favorites, at least in the history of American religion, is, um, is the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, that book is 
uh, I think has to go down as, as one of the great American memoirs um, of, of, of any genre. Um, but it is, it is such a powerful religious memoir. Um, and, and I think that that, that book um, really opens up a lot for uh, readers about the, the, the suffering and the, the, the misery of racist oppression, um, in this case in um, mid-20th century um, Michigan, um, where, where he grew up, um, and the experience of the prison system. Uh, and the reason why um, someone like Malcolm X, not, not that his, the details of his experience are necessarily, necessarily representative even of the African-American experience uh, religiously in America, but why someone like him uh, would grow up in a, in a relatively devout Christian environment um, and go on to reject Christianity uh, for the nation of Islam and, and then later on for more uh, traditional uh, Sunni Islam itself. Um, and, and so that, that book um, is, it, it can be hard to take as I think, frankly, for, for white readers because he, he is so exceedingly negative about white people, especially in his Nation of Islam phase. I mean, he, he talks about white devils and, um, and, and the, the, the white race was a sort of devilish invention of this kind of demon figure. Um, and, and so uh, it, it, the, the racist oppression he suffers, and it's, it's, there's parts of it that are just, it's not an easy book to read in terms of a, a, a pleasant topic, but it's absolutely compelling. And I think it also, uh, it, it's another book that I would certainly recommend to any college student to read uh, to sort of broaden your, your, your perspective on uh, the African-American experience uh, the what, the connections between race and religion in, in American history, which are so important, uh, and and also just simply to read just a masterpiece of the memoir genre, uh, I I definitely recommend Malcolm X. Uh, as far as writing schedule, I am definitely a morning person. Um, I, I not that I can't write, and I often do write in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, as I've uh, grown a little older and, and gotten further into my professional life, I, I just find that I, I usually don't work um, at night. I, it's, it's not profitable. It's not the right kind of schedule for me. Um, I used to do that you know, as an undergraduate, sometimes as a graduate student, and, and occasionally even early in my tenure track career. But I, I think I'd get uh, the most work done in the morning. Um, and I, I often have uh, classes in the, in the afternoon. Um, and so I, I, I just sense that I'm, I'm ready to get the most done right when I get to work. And you know, when I was working on my dissertation, I think is when I found this out the most clearly. You know, I needed to just get a lot of work done. I didn't have the kind, I, I think sometimes productivity comes with experience. Writing breeds more writing. When, once you've written a book, you know how to write more books. But when you're writing a dissertation, it's just tough. I mean, it's it's you, you don't quite know what you're doing, and it's it's difficult. And so, I would usually set my alarm for 6 a.m. and I would get up and I would make a pot of coffee, and I wouldn't even eat anything. I would just I would just go into my office and start writing, start cranking. And a lot of times, I wouldn't even eat anything until noon or so. And and I would try to get in you know five or six hours of solid work on my dissertation. And that's how I got it done. Um, I would do that, you know, every weekday. That was kind of my routine. And I've I've sort of carried not quite that. Now I eat breakfast, but 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 it's not quite that extreme anymore. But I just know morning is prime time for me to get writing done. I usually get started writing um, by thinking through where I left off. Uh, and so the first five minutes, ideally, are me looking at what I had done the last time I wrote, hopefully the day before. And um, a lot of times, a little uh, trick that I'll use is I'll, I'll almost leave myself a sort of a dangling sentence <clears throat> where I start maybe a new paragraph, a new topic, 
um, or this is the next stage of the topic that I'm working on so that it'll be a sort of a prompt for me about, oh, right, okay, I, this is what I need to work on the next time I write. And so sometimes I'll even, um, I, I'll know that day that I could write a little more. I have a little bit more in the tank uh, you know, for this paragraph, but I'll stop and I'll say, I'm gonna leave that, those few sentences until tomorrow so that I can get cranking. And, and like everybody, I mean, the, the challenge is often getting going with the writing. Uh, and, and, and if I write just a little bit, then it gets easier to write more. Uh, and, and so if I, if I make it easy on myself by leaving a little bit to write from the day before, that, that makes it easier to get, get started that morning. In the trade-off between writing and editing, um, I, I, I can't say that I am really strict about, you know, I will only write at this stage and I'll only edit at this stage, but I am mindful um, as I'm writing a chapter um, that I, I'd like to get through the chapter um, before I, I really do any kind of formal editing of it. Um, so I, I do think it's a good idea to try to just get the chapter written, not, not, not as fast as you can, but not to uh, be constantly questioning yourself and going back and, and, and uh, revisiting what you've already written. Um, so what I tend to do is I write a whole chapter um, and then I go back and, and get, do a pass-through edit of that, of that chapter. Um, and I, I, I'm mostly just looking for problems with the prose and superfluous language and superfluous adverbs and, and those kind of things, repetitive passages. Um, and then um, when I get to the end of a manuscript, I usually write, uh, start with chapter one and then write in order uh, the chapters that, that need to be written. And then before I write the introduction and conclusion, I usually read through the whole manuscript again and do another pass of editing while I'm doing it, but to sort of get a, a sense for um, what does this all amount to and are there things that, I'm, that I've really missed. And then I feel more prepared at that point. Um, not only have I done an, uh, a, a second full editing pass throughout the whole manuscript, but I feel better prepared at that point to summarize what the manuscript actually says. Um, I, I don't tend to be very dogmatic about much in writing, but I really don't understand how you can write an introduction before you've written the manuscript, um, because it, it just seems to me that you're going to find out as you go along what you actually have to say. And it's, it's difficult for me to ever imagine feeling like I have a firm grip on what a whole manuscript is gonna say before I've written it. So, so uh, that, that in, a, in other words, that uh, pass through of the whole manuscript before doing the introduction and the conclusion serves uh, as an editing uh, opportunity for me, but also I'm able to kind of stand back and think through what the whole manuscript amounts to. And that also lends itself to knowing what I need to add, maybe what I need to subtract, what I need to emphasize throughout the whole manuscript. And that's certainly a part of editing too, beyond just the tinkering with the prose in an individual sentence. As far as outlining, uh, I do very little outlining. Um, I, I probably do an unusually limited amount of outlining. Um, I normally have to produce a, an outline of a book project um, as I'm, I'm normally approaching a publisher uh, on the front end of the, of the book project. That's, that's different for a lot of doctoral students who are writing a dissertation uh, that they hope to be their first book and they're gonna deliver a whole manuscript to a press. Uh, when they're approaching them about getting a contract. I normally now approach the, the press at the front end, and so I have to show them some kind of outline um, that, that shows, you know, I've given enough thought to understand what I see probably is the overview of the project. 
Um, but in terms of um, certainly any kind of paragraph by paragraph outlining or you know very detailed outlining, I don't do any of that. Uh, and and the reason is is because I figure that again I'm going to find out. Um, beyond just the general topic. I mean, I'm going to find out what's going to happen from paragraph to paragraph as I actually write those paragraphs. And inevitably, uh, the chapter will take uh, turns that I didn't expect to have happen um, as I'm actually writing it. And so I find, you know, we've covered this much and we've, we've covered these topics. Now it really would make sense for me to get into this issue now. And I just don't have a lot of confidence that I could have figured that out at an outline level. Now, th this is an area that I definitely recommend that you do what suits your personality as a writer. And writers have very different dispositions and temperaments uh, in the way that they work. And so I know that outlining a lot uh, works for certain people, and that's that's perfectly fine. I don't I don't have any problem with it. It doesn't work that well for me. And so I, I, I tend to do as little outlining as I can get away with with doing. As far as what my goal is in a day of writing, um, if I have a full writing day, and I do sometimes, uh, given the nature of my teaching schedule, for sure in the summer, uh, but but also uh, even when I'm teaching, some days I'll have open for writing. And uh, when I have a day like that, I'm usually shooting for uh, a word count. And, and for me, it's usually a thousand words. Um, I, I find that a thousand words um, tends to uh, push me a little bit beyond what I kind of naturally feel like doing. But it, it, but it also is achievable. I, I wouldn't want a word. I know there's some academics that are like 2,000, 2,500 words. Uh, for me, that seems like a little too much because I, I, I'm, I'm just afraid I would be constantly missing it and I would find that frustrating. I find it much more satisfying to have a word goal that I can pretty consistently hit. I, I, don't, I don't hit 1,000 words every day in writing, that's, that's for sure. But it, it, it's, it's a bit of a stretch, and it, yet it remains realistic, uh, and it, it keeps me on pace uh, for all the writing that I need to do. Now, I would say comparatively, I have a, a lot of writing that I do. Um, I, I do publish books pretty regularly, but I also blog. Uh, I have a fair number of book reviews that I do, uh, occasional writing pieces that or commissioned and, and so forth. And so I, I find that if I'm doing a thousand words on every writing day or roughly a thousand words, um, that, that, that puts me in a position where I'm hitting my deadlines, I'm, I'm delivering manuscripts on time and all the things that I need to do to, to be responsible to all my writing commitments. Um, now, there are definitely days where I write more than a thousand words, and that's great. 1,500 words is, is certainly not unheard of for me. Um, there's some days where it's just a slog, or I'm, I'm in really unfamiliar territory, and it just takes me a lot longer to kind of get my act together to write the next few paragraphs. And, and so, no problem. I mean, uh, you know, if I, I mean, there's some days where really I'm just writing. Two or three hundred words, or something. But but even that, I think, is far superior to writing nothing at all. Uh, and I, I think that the the real problem that I see graduate students and early career professors uh, getting into is that, truth be told, uh, they're on a deadline for publishing their first book or they're uh, on a deadline for how long they can be in their graduate program. And truth be told, they are not writing. And that, that's just a real problem that we have to fess up to, uh, that when we're letting days, weeks, months, and, and sometimes realistically even years go by where we're not actually writing. And so we're on a word count, uh, whether we admit it or not, 
I mean, you have to average a certain number of words to get to your writing goal when you have a book length project that you're working on or, or even our article length project. And so I think it's good to just go ahead and be realistic about how much progress you need to be making and how much amount of time and you can count it up. And uh, maybe given your uh, working situation, uh, 300 words is a more realistic goal. 700 words, a thousand, the, the word count doesn't really make that much of a difference, but I, I think if you are not mindful of how much progress you're actually making, you're, you're setting yourself up for trouble. Uh, for people who are struggling getting any writing done uh, and the weeks are going by and they, they realize they're not uh, getting writing done, I do think that um, there is such a thing as kind of writer's block. Um, but but uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, there, there's real power in just going ahead and, and writing. Um, and uh, if it gets really difficult for you, um, I, I, I would just recommend getting down to the level of seeing if you can write one sentence. Um, if, that, if that's how blocked up you are, just, just see if you can write one sentence that day. And that writing, that just simple act of, of a little bit of writing, a lot of times will prompt more writing and, and more writing. Um, and so I, I think sometimes uh, I'm even a little hesitant to talk about a thousand word a day word limit or something like that because people hear that and they're just like, you're, you, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I'm not, I can't, I can't write anything right now. The, the point is not a particular number. The point is making some progress. Now, if you are under contract to write a book uh, or if you, you're on a clock for your dissertation, say, um, there is going to have to come a point where you make more progress than, say, one sentence a day. I mean, that, that's, that's just the reality. But I think sometimes it can start getting so psychologically kind of overwhelming about, I'm not making progress. I'm not making progress. What's, what's the matter? Why am I not? The, the answer to that usually is just write something today. Um, and, and if you can do that, I think for most people, usually that will lead to more productivity of the, of the level that you need to get to. It is a challenge writing for different kinds of audiences. In my career, I've written, um, you know, for uh, academic presses, academic journals, uh, general interest magazines, uh, blogs. I mean, so so I've, I've covered a lot of different styles of writing, um, and I I think that doing those different kinds of styles of writing t tends to make you a better writer in all areas because they they tend to help with the deficiencies of, of you know, the other genre of, or other genres of, of writing. And, and uh, goodness knows a lot of academics need help about writing in a clear and accessible fashion. Um, and and I, I just think too much academic writing is just inscrutable and, and badly written. Um, and writing for a general audience can help uh, alleviate that. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, a lot of, uh, pop writing, general audience writing, uh, can tend to just be fluff uh, and not really mean very much. And, and so academic uh, levels of under, professional academic levels of understanding, I think, can, can really be uh, a great thing for, for a popular audience. It's much needed. Um, there, there's obviously a question about whether a popular audience is going to resonate with, you know, you know academic uh, perspectives on, on a given subject. But in, in any case, it needs to happen uh, that academics are bringing uh, their knowledge to a popular audience. So I, I definitely encourage that. I, I mean, I do think you, you have to pick up on what these different genres expect from, from a writer uh, so that the most obvious difference for me uh, is that when I'm doing strictly academic writing, there's going to be a lot of presentation about uh, historiography or what if other historians have said about a given topic. And there's, you know, maybe pages of sort of comparing different approaches to this topic. 
and the the history of the history of this of this subject. A general audience does not want to know that. Uh, they will be put off by it. And unless there's some kind of narrative action associated with the historical debate over a subject, then you just leave it out when you're when you're speaking to a general audience. Um, but that's not that's not that hard for me to do. It's just you know remember who's going to be reading this and what are their expectations of this style of writing. And once you're attentive to that, I think you're, you're you know you're a pretty long way down the road of being able to write for different kinds of audiences. Probably my favorite book uh, that, I, that I've written, at least favorite book to write, was um, my book, The Great Awakening, The Roots of Evangelical Christianity in Colonial America. It came out with Yale Press in 2007. Um, one of the things I enjoyed so much about writing that book is that it was a challenge in the literature on the Great Awakening. There, there was a Yale historian who had actually said that there was no Great Awakening, uh, that the Great Awakening was invented by later historians. And I, I really was excited by the challenge of taking up uh, that, that, um, that task to show there actually was a Great Awakening, and it was an intercolonial, uh, international, transatlantic, powerful spiritual movement um, that, that really was probably the greatest social, cultural, and obviously religious upheaval in America prior to the American Revolution. Um, so I, I felt uh, the, the importance, the weight of the task. And then it also, more than any book I've written, it allowed me to get into um, a lot of archives up and down the East Coast uh, from um, New England to South Carolina. Uh, digging in th through the, the the actual primary source documents, the, the the manuscript themselves, handwritten manuscripts by people who were involved with the Great Awakening. Uh, not that the, some of these sources had been looked at before, but some of them had been almost entirely uh, neglected. Um, one source that I particularly enjoyed was um, a, a diary by a revivalist named Daniel Rogers that is now held, I think, at the New York Historical Society. It's about 500 pages long, uh, and by one author, uh, manuscript diary, handwritten. It's probably the single longest source in America related to the Great Awakening, as, at least a manuscript source. And it, I, I can't tell you uh, just the amazing things that were happening in these revival meetings that Daniel Rogers was going to. I mean, it was, it was wild stuff. Um, you know, people who were having visions, people who were prophesying. Uh, it, it was like what you would imagine in a really intense, charismatic or Pentecostal uh, church today, but it was happening in the 1740s. And for Daniel Rogers, it, I mean, this guy had been a tutor at Harvard and he, he was born again under George Whitfield's preaching and has completely changed his life. And the next thing you know, He's preaching at these revival meetings that are going around the clock, 24 hours a day. People are there in these church services. And I mean, it's just a world of wonders. And you know, sometimes I would call my wife and, and say, you're not gonna believe what he's talking about now. And, and so that was just a moment for me of just the joy of archival research. Um, people knew about this diary. I think I might have been the first person to ever since you know, I, you know, since Daniel Rogers, maybe to read the whole thing through, um, and so that that was just uh, fresh, exciting, uh, and and I was just I just love bringing that into the literature on on the Great Awakening and lots of other sources uh, like it, and and putting all that stuff together to hopefully I, I think show that you know the Great Awakening really did happen, and it, it was really as big as it has been advertised to be. One of the things that I uh, often talk, talk about it with colleagues and in my uh, newsletter is um, the use of technology. And, and in, in this day and age, we all know that our phones and social media and everything are just, they just seem to be taking over our lives and they're distracting us. 
they're hurting our productivity for those of us who are trying to write. Um, you know, it's it, it really gets down to a kind of daily battle to, to maintain control of your attention. Um, but our personal technology is, is definitely not helping with that. And so um, one of the things uh, I, I have talked about along these lines is uh, the actual use of a, of a phone. Um, and I'm, I'm something of a, of a phone minimalist. I, I, did, I, I, I don't just have a Nokia or something, something like that, but, but um, I, I did get a, a, an iPhone a few years ago, but I've set up structures that I think are, are worth considering for you um, uh, about how to use your phone and to sort of keep it at the margins of, of your daily life. Um, some of the ways that, that I've done that is that, for instance, uh, some of you know that, that I'm very active on social media, especially on Twitter, um, but I do not have any social media apps on my phone of, of any kind. Um, and when I check uh, social media, it's always on a computer. And so um, there's also a, a lot of times, uh, especially on the weekends for me, where um, I just simply don't have my phone with me. Um, and that's that's become, uh, it feels like uh, almost kind of a risky thing to do in the, this day and age to not have your phone with you. But I think that that, that is a, a really good discipline. So not having the apps uh, except for what you absolutely need on, on your phone. And, and I would encourage you to think about not having social media apps because I think one of, the, one of the biggest dangers that we have is this mindless scrolling through social media and filling time every kind of waking moment that we don't have anything in particular to do. We just, we just scroll through. Or, uh, you know, I, one of the challenges I find that I face is that I know that I have something I need to do and I procrastinate by using my phone. So some structural impediments against that can really help. And, and the number one thing for me has been, I, I once had Facebook and Twitter uh, on my phone and I, and I don't anymore and I, and I never have, have looked back. Um, I also, uh, with, with my phone, I, don't, I do have an email program on my phone, but I almost never check email on my phone. Uh, except when I'm, say, traveling and I'm gonna, I know I'm going to be away from my computer for 8, 10, 12 hours I, I, and it's a work day, I'll, uh, those are just about the only cases in which I'll check email on my phone. Um, this one I actually find to be fairly easy because what, whatever it is, I have Outlook. Um, I don't find it easy to manage uh, email on my phone, and so I don't actually find it tempting uh, when I'm at home to, uh, or you know, at work to, to check email on my phone. The bigger challenge for me is I'm in front of my computer so much of the time is you know, constantly going back and opening email on, on my computer, but that's a topic for another time. Um, so don't check email on my phone. I don't have social media apps on, on my phone. Um, and at night, um, I have my phone on sleep mode from about uh, nine o'clock until 7 a.m. And if you're familiar with this, what the, this means is that unless you uh, have certain emergency contacts that you opt in to this system, your phone uh, won't have any notifications or calls or anything like that during those designated hours. I have a couple relatives of mine that, that I have designated as emergency contacts and Nobody else, um, and I, I know in certain work situations that that's not going to work. But um, I've, I've found I, you know there's nothing worse than getting a you, you know a spam phone call at two o'clock in the morning or something like that. So I've just completely eliminated that possibility with the the uh, sleep mode. Um, so you may be thinking, well, what in the world do you use your phone for? <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, the main things that I use my phone for uh, when I'm at, 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 in town, not, not traveling. When I'm traveling, my phone use goes way up because, because I have so many things then that I need to use, use it for. I you know, use the Uber app and I use um, a white noise app to, to help me sleep at night. And um, I use the alarm, which I do not use at home. So when I'm traveling, it's a different it's a different situation. But when I'm in town, um, the two main things that I use my phone for these days are uh, the Audible app, 
uh, on which I listen to, I'm pretty much constantly listening to books. Uh, that's, that's another way that I do sort of pleasure reading and books that I maybe are not in my field, but I just like to be able to read. A lot of times I'll listen to them on the Audible app. And I mostly use that uh, while I'm commuting to and from work. And um, sometimes if I don't have a lunch appointment, I'm just eating lunch by myself, I'll listen to Audible uh, during that time too. And then uh, I use my phone for texting, um, but I am very uh, limited about who I give my cell phone number to. Uh, and so almost all the texting that I do, uh, I would say 95% of the texting that I do is with my wife. Um, she's really about the only person in my life that I want to be consistently texting with, and, and I hope you'll tell her that. Uh, and, and so um, I, I honestly sometimes will have conversations with people that are even a little awkward about, they'll say, uh, well, can I text you about that? And I, I, I say, eh, you know, just send me an email. Just send me an email because I find that if I don't initiate texting with people, and especially, obviously, if they don't have my number, that cuts way down on the amount of texting that, that I do. Now, again, you may be in a work situation where it is an expectation uh, that, that people have your, your number. Uh, my boss does have my number, and, and you know, he's, he's very limited about the amount that, that he texts me. Um, so uh, I, I really am able to limit it mostly to my wife and my wife and I you know, maybe text a few times a, a, a day. And so that's, that's my, but I, I just don't text very much. So some of that I know is, you know, really old school, but the, the, the byproduct of it is, is that um, I can spend most of my days um, with my phone uh, in its holster and I'm not paying attention to it. And it, it's, it's really more of a backup for me when occasionally I need to contact somebody fast, uh, or uh, and, and of course it serves me well for the Audible app and contacting my wife when I need to, when I want to talk to her, and uh, that that's really on a day to day basis about the way that I use it, and uh, that's worked really well for me in terms of making uh, my phone use it's it's pretty marginal to my life.